Okay, so in 1985, th- that next year, you were involved in the capture of Mexican drug lord Rafael Caro Quintero. Yes, I was. I was. A, I had not even a year on the job, and I was sent to Mexico to help. That's when our agent, uh, Kike Camarena. I mean, great story, tragic ending. What happened to him? Uh, they sent me to go look, help in the search for uh, Agent Camarena and Rafael Caro Quintero. We still hadn't found the body yet until the Mexicans uh, pretty much told us where the, the body was. And then we started searching, looking for Rafael Caro Quintero. And I just have to mention Agent Camarena, I mean, that death, what they did to him is just unbelievable. It never should have happened to a human being. And that's why, you know, I get a little personal with it, but uh, we, you know, we will never rest until Carlo Quintero comes to the United States. And I'm going to say he's still in Mexico. Uh, He escaped. He was recently arrested. And I just hope he gets extradited so he can serve his uh, justice in the United States. Okay. And uh, Quintero, was actually the co-founder of the Guadalajara cartel. Yeah, Sinaloa and, Guadalajara cartel. Yeah, that is correct. Right. right. And him and Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo uh, were kind of the big dogs during this this time. And like you said, like you had mentioned earlier, they ended up uh, kidnapping Kiki and torturing him and eventually killing him. Right. 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 And before before he he uh, before dying, they would pump him full of adrenaline to keep him alive so they could hit him some more, which is that that's why it just never should have happened. Yes. Did you, did you know Kiki personally? No, I never met him. No. And I had like nine months on the job when they sent, you know, they needed help. Obviously I spoke Spanish, but it was an experience uh, for me. And uh, Carlo Quintero, there was another guy, Mata Ballesteros, who was also involved, later on captured. So it was a big organization, but, uh, and I was used to the street type traffickers. You know, now I'm, you know, dealing with the big uh, type guys. But uh, eventually, like and I mentioned, Carlo Quintero was arrested, then he bribed himself out of jail in Mexico until he recently got caught about a couple of years ago, I think. And uh, he's awaiting extradition. I just hope he, you know, comes to the United States. Yeah, right. He was arrested in Mexico on uh, July 15, 2022, and he's okay. there's a pending extradition to the Correct. U.S., but Correct. I guess we're not sure. We're not sure, yeah. Now, Steve, how much of a turning point was the Kiki um, kidnapping and, and murder in terms of how the DEA viewed the situation in Mexico and Colombia? Well, it it uh, so this was this all happened before my time. I came on DEA in 1987, mm, but right. it showed it demonstrated to the entire world the ruthlessness associated with these drug cartels, especially the Mexican cartels. The fact that I mean, taking a needle of adrenaline and shooting into somebody's heart to revive them. So you could torture him again and kill him. I mean, I think from what we've been told, Kiki died three times before he finally succumbed completely. It's just horrible. But the uh, it it also showed the resolve of the United States because the president stepped up. And when the Mexicans, they just tried to, you know, brush everything under the rug and, and they threw a scapegoat out there. So all oh, this guy's the guy that killed Kiki. And everybody knew that wasn't true. So the president shut down the border uh, with Mexico, between Mexico and the United States. And that showed the resolve of the United States to, we're going to protect our people. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I, I'm, I would venture to say, I don't know this for a fact, but I would venture to say that after all that happened, that probably increased the number of applicants to DEA because they saw, you know, here's a kick-ass agency that if I do get in a bind, they they got my back. You know, and, that, and in law enforcement culture, that means a lot. Well, yeah. And uh, I mean, that whole story was laid out in Narcos uh, season one, I think, right? No, season one was Pablo Escobar, the first one. What was, but but the Kiki story was in... uh... That's in, uh, yes, Narcos, Mexico. Narcos, Mexico. There we go. Okay, got it. Yeah, I remember seeing it. I I just got a little confused. Uh, Okay, so Steve, uh, like you had mentioned, you actually joined the DEA in 1987. Mm -hmm. Why join the DEA? Well, uh, so I I worked for the city for six years, and uh, then I got offered a job with the railroad police in Norfolk, Virginia, Um, and my pay doubled. So it's, you know, first of all, you don't go into law enforcement for the pay. You know, you're not going to get wealthy then there unless you're corrupt. And and we'll be the first to say nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. 
So we don't condone that type of behavior. But <clears throat> as a railroad police officer, I, I did a couple of years down in the Tidewater area and then transferred back to West Virginia. And uh, one of my best friends had come on as a, as a police detective for the railroad. He's former Virginia State Trooper. His name's Pete Ramey, still a dear, dear friend. And Pete had worked for the Virginia State Police and, and uh, big, big man. I mean, just a big man and did a lot of undercover drug work for the DEA task force out of Roanoke, Virginia. And he'd tell me all these stories. I didn't know what DEA was. <clears throat> I'd never heard of a DEA agent. <laughs> but as I, you know, you started doing your research and find out a little bit more, I thought, man, that is, that just sounds like excitement. And, you know, don't, don't, please don't ever think that we're up here pretending to be tough guys. Cause that's not what we did all this for. You know, we just did our jobs all we did. So <clears throat> applied for that, finished my, my college degree, applied for the DEA, got hired. And uh, so my first post was Miami, Florida in 1987. Still the Wild West in South Florida back then. Just crazy. Now, the first undercover, they signed you to a senior partner. I was in Group 10, Enforcement Group 10. Uh, my senior partner was Gene Franco. And Gene had, at that time, probably had 16, 18 years on the job. One of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. Knew everything about aircraft, smuggling, and that kind of stuff. So he had been working this case where the intent was to prove that that the Castros were allowing Cuba to be used as a transshipment point for cocaine coming into South Florida. So we go out and meet these two informants and uh, <laughs> called them Cheech and Chong's, two old guys, a white guy and an Asian guy. And we're, of course, we went to the real fancy places like you see on Miami Vice. We're at the Denny's on 36th Street next to the Miami airport. That's how fancy it was. And uh, so these guys come in and they start talking about 500 kilos of cocaine. And, and I'm a new guy, so I keep my mouth shut. We're on the way back to the office and Gino looks over at me and he's like, he said, like, rookie, what do you think? I'm like, Gino, those guys are full of crap, aren't they? And he said, what do you say that for? I've been using these guys for a couple of years. I said, Gene, they're talking 500 kilos of cocaine. There's not that much dope in the world at one time, is there? <laughs> and he looked at me, he's like, where are you from? <laughs> so what that, now, and before I came to DEA, the most cocaine I'd ever, powder cocaine I'd ever seen at one time was two ounces, a baggie about like this. Eventually, I got to go on my first undercover trip from Fort Lauderdale, Miami, down to the Turks and Caicos Islands, which I'd never heard of. We were on an undercover 53-foot uh, Hatter Sport Fisherman that was wired for sound and video. Long story short, two pilots flew in a twin engines from Cuba. As they came to the end, in Providence, the Islands, as they came to the end of the runway, they turned around, and we're working with the local cops. The back door throws open, and they throw these green duffel bags out. Then they taxi back up, refuel, and go back to Cuba. We had a we had a P3 up, uh, I guess called AWACS, tracking this plane. So that's how we know it came from Cuba and went back to Cuba. But I went from two ounces of cocaine to 400 kilos, 880 pounds. So you know what? At that point, I was addicted to cocaine, just in a different way. 